himself to the atmosphere of the glory. Because the Bible says the natural man of this people is mighty. There are three dimensions of God's presence. Start in scripture. The first dimension of his presence is what the Bible calls his omnipresence. His ability to be everywhere at the same time. The psalmist said, where can I hide from your presence? Where can I hide from your presence? He is suffering. He began the beginning. The Bible says his eyes run through and fro, searching the entire earth. And so, when you talk of the omnipresence of God, it's His ability to be everywhere at the same time. When Adam sinned in the garden, the Bible says they went and they hid. And in Genesis chapter 3, the Bible says, and they had the voice of God. The Hebrew word says, they had the talking spirit walking in the cool of the day. And He said, Adam, where art thou? And Adam said, I heard thy voice and I hid. Because I was naked. Where can I hide from your presence? And that's the reason why the Bible says how that he has the ability not only to scan his eyes around the world, but to scan the hearts of men and judge the intents of the hearts of men. He is omnipresent. It's an ability that is exclusively for the God class. His ability to be everywhere. That's the reason why all believers all over the world can lift up their voice to God for help. And at the very same time, He is able to respond to their needs. He is able to relate with you. While He's there with you in the room, He's there on a crusade ground. He's there helping a woman to deliver safely. He's there helping somebody out of accident. He's omnipresent. Listen, sometimes we need to know the qualities of God to help us worship Him. Because a lot of times we think He's like one of us. But when we understand that although we are partakers of His divine nature, we didn't give Him the nature. He's, he brought us into a participation of His nature. But then there are certain dimensions of his nature that has not been given to us to participate. That's the dimension that makes him God. One of it is his omnipresence. No man has in himself the ability to be everywhere at the same time. Even Satan does not have that ability. In the book of Job chapter 1, the Bible says the sons of God gathered and Satan was in their midst. And God asked him from whence and he said from running to and fro. He was at a specific location. But God is in this place. And all over the world where true believers are gathered in the name of Jesus Christ. He's there in their midst. His omnipresence. The second dimension of him is what I call his Emmanuel dimension. The Bible says where two or three are gathered in his name. He says he's there. Emmanuel means God in the midst of his people. God with us. His ability that every time we gather in the name of Jesus, we are confident that he's there in our midst. That's the dimension of him that gives us confidence to agree with one another and pray and say, Lord, we commit this issue and that issue and we are sure that he is in our midst. Listen, you need to learn to look at God not just as a king seated far in some galaxies. You need to realize that you are before the throne. I like that beautiful song. So we bow as we enter the throne room. There is none like you. 
in your presence that is where I must be very powerful song the Bible says let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace if you couldn't come the Bible will not ask you to come so we have the ability to be in the throne room we have the ability to be with him where he is otherwise there's no point talking about koinonia many of us see God high up there and sometimes we come out of our rooms and say God I hope you can hear me but you need to realize that he is how did darling Jack put it so close I believe you're holding me now in your hands I belong you, you never let me go he's so close He's not just far up here. So his Emmanuel dimension begins to give you the consciousness that he's not only alive and around, but he's with you. The Bible calls him our ever-present help in time of need. The one who sticks closer than the only brother. The third dimension of his presence is called his Shekinah. His manifested presence. Where not only is he in the midst of his people but there is an awareness of your spirit your soul and your body the environment animate and inanimate things realize that their maker is in their midst and you are engulfed in the glory and in his presence and that's what causes the shaking the falling down and all of the supernatural manifestations the Bible says, when that dimension happens, it says the mountains keep like lambs. The awe and the majesty of His presence. When Israel complained and said, is it only Moses that God will speak to? He said, alright, sanctify yourselves. I want to show you a sample of what my Shekinah looks like. The Bible says, when He showed up and they heard His voice, together they said, no, just speak to Moses. Anything you tell Him, we will do. The presence of God is not only majestic, it's fearful. Fearful. And that's the dimension from where miracles are released. That's the dimension from where healings are released. That's the dimension from where impartations are released. So you sit under that atmosphere of the Shekinah and you step out in the realm of glory. Suddenly you begin to see that there is an overflow of his life and glory in your life. There is beauty that emanates from your life. That's why we spend time in worship. Because we want to allow not only our spirits, but our souls and our mortal bodies to interact with that atmosphere of his Shekinah. And suddenly you find out that tumors disappear, growths disappear. Because everything that symbolizes death is always swallowed up in victory. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And so I'd like you to always have that consciousness that every time we come before God's presence, every time we come before God's presence, our hearts must be open to just soak in that atmosphere of His glory. Realize that you're not just singing. You're not just helping the worshippers but you are standing in the presence of God from where the life of that river the life of that glory rubs up upon your life and when you step out see let me tell you something you will not realize how changed you are in God's presence until you step back in the midst of the darkness and then you see how much illumination comes out from your spirit you find out that suddenly certain vocabularies just edit themselves out of your life you don't know when that transition happened it happened in the glory certain decisions certain decisions and resolutions are crystallized in your spirit you begin to make up your mind the grace to walk in certain realms is imparted in his presence. That's why we gather here. Hallelujah. So Lord, we thank you for the gift of your presence. We really thank you for your presence. And tonight as we behold you, 
let us be changed into that which we are beholding. The Bible says, now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. He says, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of God. We are changed from one dimension of glory. And so let us be changed in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Romans. I'll just talk very briefly. The book of Romans. is seeking men and women who will carry the life the power the glory of the kingdom and permeate the systems of the world this has been his singular message and let me tell you something about God when God calls him and the Bible says that he's, Jesus Christ saw different kinds of people scattered around and he called them, come, follow me. He called Nathaniel. He called Peter. He called the disciples. When God calls a man, he doesn't send the man immediately. He calls you. Then the next thing is that he makes you. He said, come and I will make you. And for three and a half years, by the teaching of his word, by the experience of the miraculous things he did, he made them. And then the Bible says, He sent them at a certain time, the twelve, to go and test run the things that He was imparting in them. The Bible says they came back rejoicing. Then He sent them alongside 70 others. And the Bible says they came to Him rejoicing. They said, Even the devils were subject to us in Thy name. But even at that dimension, they were still in the making process. Listen, it pays to stay in the school of the Spirit. Sometimes, you see, the caliber of people that God is raising here. I, I have the privilege of knowing a lot of us here. And I know the dimensions that we are functioning in the Spirit. Terrible realms in the Spirit. Yet the Lord is still subjecting us to the making process. Because when He is done with us, and he sends us out. We will be absolute wonders to our generation. That's what he's doing. He said, he that bears fruit, I will prune, sharpen, refire, that he may bear much fruit. That's what God is doing. So when God calls a man, he makes him. Some of you may be wondering, Lord, with this level of anointing, you have still not sent me. And God says, sit down. You need more than you have now to touch your generation. This may be sufficient to touch Samaru, but not the nations. This may be sufficient to touch Zaria, but not the nations. This may be sufficient to touch Nigeria, but not the nations. The Bible says, who through faith subdued kingdoms. Every time God keeps reminding me that I'm still in the making process. I tell people, if you think you've seen anything about my life, this is only the beginning. Because I'm still in the baking room of the Spirit. That's why, you see, when you are conscious of being made, no level of glory will carry your heat, will, will enter your head such that you lose out on the remaining training. After doing terrible things in righteousness, you go back to the secret place. But a day will come when the Master will tap you. And say, this is my beloved son. And he will command the world to hear you. When he makes that decree, the doors of nations become open out of their own volition. No, you become an infant of fire. Nobody will be able to stop you. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 8. Verse 18. 
For I reckon Oh by the way I I decided to suspend We are taking a series on The ancient parts How many of you were blessed last week? Hallelujah But I decided to Just fold that series And keep it aside Until we are in full strength Because it's a very critical teaching That I want everybody to be part of Hallelujah And so I just decided to wrap it And keep it ancient secrets we began by examining Jeremiah chapter 6 he said ask for the ancient part and walk in it and we spoke last week about the anointing I wanted to complete the series it's a long series it will take us at least 4 weeks to explore some of the things and so I just decided to keep it until we have all our other members around so that we can flow together hallelujah so tonight I'm going to be teaching very briefly on the pathway to sonship. The pathway to sonship. The pathway to sonship. I trust that the Lord will grant us grace. You would have noticed that here we don't just teach results, we teach the process. Because when you understand the process and the principles, then the results are inevitable. Hallelujah. The pathway to sonship. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. 19. For the earnest expectation of creation wasted for the manifestations of the sons of God. For the creation was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who had subjected the same in hope. Because the creation itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, who are the first fruits of the Spirit, even ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption that is the redemption of our body. Look up. I want to share with us very briefly on the process, the making of a son. Now, there are many Greek words that were used in scripture to connote uh, sons, many of them, but there are two interesting ones I want to teach on. The first is called Technon. And the second is called Weos. Technon and Weos. Two powerful words. Hallelujah. Now I'd like you to understand that when you give birth to a child, please watch this. When you give birth to a child, that child comes with um, a thinking process and a mindset that does not permit him to do a lot of things in that environment. Hallelujah. And over time, as the child begins to watch other people, elderly people, and as he begins to interact with his environment, certain things begin to become evident in the child's life. When he's always lying down and he watches people walking, one day he will attempt to begin to do what they are doing. Are you following me now? And then he begins to try to talk. Then he begins to try to reason. And over time, there is a metamorphosis in that child. From complete childhood, he becomes a teenager, and then uh, an adolescent, and then an adult, and so on and so forth. That's the way it is in the spirit. And we are in their need of sons. We have a lot of children in the body. And there is need for men. The Bible says that God desires to bring many into sonship. Now, sonship is not just the issue of confessing and saying, I'm a son. I receive it. You don't receive sonship by impartation. It's a door. It's a process. It's a making. Just like, how many of you have seen little children who try to behave like adults? You just see a little child and then he, he takes with one and tries to gum it around his face in an attempt to look like an adult. Does that make him an adult? That very act proves that he's still a child. Hallelujah. 
And so, we have a lot of believers who camouflage as sons. I need you to know tonight that sonship is not just about confession. You don't just receive sonship. I know that many of you would say, oh, the Bible says, to them that believe in Him, He gave you the right to be called sons of God. I'm going to explain something to you. A lot of translations, in, especially in the old King James, certain words were interchanged. Two of them was weos and technon. Technon talks of a child, a baby, one who is, has inadequate knowledge and education and information. One who is not able to do a lot of things. And then we are stocks of one who, by reason of knowledge, has attained the same status with his father. So there is an interplay of those words in scripture. And many of them have been interpreted sons. sons. Are you following me now? When you get born again, when you accept Jesus Christ into your life, the first thing that happens is that there is a translation. I've always used this. Let me use two people. I like being very graphic. Please, Aaron, come, sir. Come. Just one here, one here. Hallelujah. Now, this is the world system. This is the kingdom where Satan is Lord. A system that was built by Cain. The Bible says Cain departed from the presence of God. And he built a city and named it after his son Enoch. And the Bible says that all kinds of rebellious things happen in that city. A city that did not recognize and work with the government of God. Hallelujah. And so, we are born with this system. We live here. There is a law in this realm. It's called the law of sin and death. That's the law that is responsible for greed and wickedness. And oppression and selfishness. The spirit of the power of the air that works in the sons of disobedience. And so, we are all born in this realm. But every time we accept that Jesus is Lord of our lives, there is a translation. You need to understand this. You, are not, you may not feel anything happen to you. How be it in the spirit, there is a translation from this kingdom, the kingdom of darkness, into the kingdom of light. The kingdom of God's dear son. Hallelujah. But now, what we do not realize is that when you are born again, that initial experience affects only your spirit. Are you following me? This is where a lot of people miss out. Let me give you a scriptural proof. When Israel came out of Egypt, that's a type of our coming out. Are you following me now? When Israel came out of Egypt, it was a type of our coming out. But there needed to be a separation. Are you following me? What the Red Sea did was it caused a permanent separation between Egypt and Israel. And they sang, they said, I will sing unto the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horses and his riders, the systems have been thrown into the sea. So many believers, what they do is they just come out of Egypt and stop. And then later on they find out that Pharaoh is still looking for them. The first step to get to the promised land is to come out of Egypt, but that's not the only step. The second step is that there must be a passing through the sea. The Bible says that we'll be washed by the, the regenerating of the water. There is an experience of passing through the water in the spirit. And that's what causes the Bible says, except you be born of water and of the spirit. He said you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So it's one thing to see the kingdom. He was speaking to Nicodemus. You can see the kingdom when you step out of Egypt. But it takes a washing of the water and of the spirit for you to experientially begin to enter the realities of the things of the spirit. There are so many believers that see the kingdom. They can describe what it looks like. But it takes the interaction of the water. So that we begin to step into the reality of it. So there is a translation. When you come into this realm, the ministry of the Holy Spirit changes in your life. Because he that told his ministry would, because as a non-believer, his ministry is to convict you of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Now when you become a believer 
and he comes to live inside you. His ministry changes. He begins to be unto you an advocate, a teacher, a strengthener, a guide, a standby, an intercessor. He begins to bring the reality of the revelation of the word into your spirit. And he begins to teach you the principles of this kingdom. As he teaches you the principles of the kingdom, grace is imparted upon you to begin to walk experientially in that reality. Hallelujah. And so I'd like you to know that it is true that in Christ we are all sons. But it takes the revelation. There is a making that brings you into an experiential position of sonship. So there are many of us that look like sons. But in reality, we are not experiencing the benefits and the blessings that follow sons. The Bible says an heir, as long as he's a child, Galatians 4, different not from a slave. Although that child is royalty, but because he must be made, there is a process that makes him. In the process of the making of that child, they teach him the attitude of royalty. They teach him how to speak like royalty. They teach him how to walk like royalty. They teach him how to respond to situations like royalty. And over time, when he has been tried and proven, then certain riches of that kingdom is now committed to him. Hear me, friends. There are certain realities in the spirit that only sons can touch. No matter how you shout, there will keep being a call upon your spirit, man, to step up into the reality of sonship. Hallelujah. Bringing many sons into glory. And so the Holy Spirit begins to walk upon your mind. The Holy Spirit begins to teach you the principles of the kingdom. Hear me. The major work of a believer, of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer, is to change his mind. Now, don't take this for granted. The major work of the Holy Ghost. Um, some years ago, when, whenever I read this scripture, is anything too hard for me to do? How many of you have read that scripture? The, the thing that bothers me about that scripture is the word too. Why will God who is almighty say is there anything too hard? Why is it too hard? And one day I asked the Holy Spirit. I said, what's the mystery behind this too hard that God is saying? And God says the reason why it seems to be too hard is that I have to keep getting you until you come into alignment with me. And that's the difficult part of the process. Because I am always able. But sometimes it takes years for him to begin to touch you. Until you come to a point where you are in synchrony with heaven. And then at that point, the realities of the things of heaven can begin to flow into your life. The primary challenge of believers is that we are yet to synchronize our minds there is there is need for a synchrony with the things of heaven such that it always will be done on earth as it is done in heaven our inability to synchronize our lives and our minds with the principles by which heaven is governed listen the same principle god is trying to give you here on earth Many of them are the same principles that govern heaven. Love. The fruit of the spirit. The, that's the principle that governs heaven. And because everyone in heaven, there is perfect synchrony to those principles. So heaven is the way it is. So why is the earth this way? Because the sons who have been given the ability to rule the earth have not yet allowed themselves to come into synchrony. And any life that will painstakingly push himself to that point suddenly begins to experience heaven within that environment. That's the reason why you can see two people living in the same environment. And one is walking in the reality of heaven's life. And the other is walking in another reality. 
Because the other one has made himself synchronized. Your mind, the Bible says, do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. Be ye changed by the renewing of your mind. Every day of my life, I keep seeing again and again that the singular secret of victory in this life is when a man can stand in synchrony with God, you will become an awesome wonder. Any man you see today who has manifested certain levels of the anointing or certain levels of notable impact has brought himself by the activity of the Spirit to that point where the laws of God becomes the laws that your life is governed by. There is perfect synchrony. At that point, heaven finds expression in your life and in your atmosphere. And so from being a child, the Holy Ghost begins to walk on their mind. The Holy Ghost begins to teach them the activities of the Spirit. The Holy Ghost begins to teach them the mindsets that the Word of God brings. Suddenly you begin to find out that over your finances, there is a principle. It's not magic. It's not mistake. It's not God liking some people and hating some people. Suddenly you begin to find out from the Word that there is He that scattereth and yet increaseth. And there is He that withholdeth more than is meat and tends to poverty. Suddenly you realize that when you bring in all your tithes into the storehouse, the heavens are open over you and the devourer is with you. Suddenly you understand that he that sweats sparingly will reap sparingly. And he that sweat bountifully will reap bountifully. As the Holy Ghost begins to bring you. Now, it's not, a, it's not one day's job. Because when the Holy Spirit brings to your mind the principles of the kingdom, the flesh in you will wrestle it. Because it knows that it will no longer hold the place of authority when the laws of God come into place. And so, it is a price. Because that will mean dropping greed, for instance. Dropping selfishness. Helping men not being weary in well-doing. And it takes the grace of God. But the beautiful thing is that as the Holy Ghost shows you the laws, He stands by you to ensure that you enforce it. Then the Holy Ghost begins to teach you about your help. He tells you that there is a system in the kingdom that can keep you free of sickness. And it looks impossible until you painstakingly cooperate with Him. Then you come to a point where you begin to understand the activity of the Spirit in your body. That if the same Spirit that raised up Christ from the dead dwells in this mortal body, not just in your spirit, that there is a divine ability there is an energizing that he causes it's like a drug he sends it all over your body and there is a quickening now it takes a while because even while you are reading that scripture the devil will bring every kind of thing your body will refuse to cooperate and Paul said I keep my body under subjection in other words you say body you are not above me. This law must, you must bend till you cooperate with this principle. Then Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 12 comes to play. He watches over his word. He's alert and active. Waiting for your obedience. So that you'll be committed to a performance. See, a time will come in life. When, when certain realities of the kingdom have not entered you, you will die. For many of us who like running from ministry ministry a time will come you will minister like this and you know that if you do not understand the quickening ministry of the holy spirit you will drop dead one day on stage because a time can come you will have ministrations all through the week and there are several things you have to attend to but when you understand that there is the quickening of the spirit there is no there's nothing like breakdown no it's supernatural they see an ordinary man but there is another law working in your memory the pathway to sonship. Where the word of God begins to paint your new reality. Your reality begins to be framed by the word of God. 
And then you understand that you have been raised up with Christ. That when he died, not only did he die for you, but you died in him. That when he was buried, you were buried in him. That when he defeated Satan, when these brothers were in him by covenant, uh, defeating Satan. And when he rose again, the Bible says he raised us up and made us to sit with him in heavenly places. Far above the witches in every village. Far above principalities and powers. And every name that is named. When that reality begins to enter your spirit. It may take a while. But when that happens, there will be a signal in the realm of the spirit. And every devil will know that this light has entered your spirit. At that point, there will be nothing of Satan in you. And you can stand. And then that scripture will now become a reality. That in my name, they shall cast out devils. You enter an atmosphere that threatens hell. Jesus walked upon the earth. And showed us an example of sonship. When he stepped into an environment. The demons suddenly began to operate. We went for a crusade after um, last week, week before last. We went for a meeting somewhere in southern Kaduna and as they just checked on us into the hotel we just laid down and I decided to take some rest. As soon as I just put my head suddenly I sensed a very evil presence and suddenly I just turned and there was a demon standing before me he said what have you come to do here I shared with them that's what he told me. He said what have you come to do here listen when you become a son when your feet steps into a territory there is a ripple effect in that territory they know that something has happened that's why you see the devil tries to fight some meetings there are some meetings he doesn't bother he even helps to plan it for them because it makes no relevance whatsoever but then there are some meetings that shake hell to its foundation and the devil begins to beat left, right and center because it's a manifestation of sons men and women who understand the laws of the spirit men and women, and, and women who have mastered the art of bringing their bodies and their minds in alignment to cooperate with the Holy Spirit so they can stand and make decrees and command nations to be opened and the gates of nations will swing open. So how are sons made? Simple. Very simple. There's no complication about it. The difference between a child and a son is knowledge, understanding and obedience. The difference between a child He says, when I was a child, first um, Corinthians chapter 13 verse 14. When I was a child, I thought like a child. I understood like a child. I acted like a child. He said, now that I'm a man, I've laid aside these childish things. The difference between a child and a son, technon and wheels, is that transition in the spirit. The Lord begins to walk. The first thing is knowledge. Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6. The Bible says, my people are destroyed. My people are destroyed. My people are destroyed. Not because Satan is powerful. Until you understand these realities in the spirit, Satan will keep looking like a mountain. I refuse to see him as a mountain. Hallelujah. It's the pathway to sonship. You come to a point where there is sufficient knowledge. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3, I believe. It says, according as His divine power hath given us all things, not some, all things that pertain unto life and godliness. How? Through the knowledge of Him that has called us into glory and virtue. The next verse says, Wherefore has He given us these exceeding great and precious promises, that by them we might be part Takers of his divine nature haven't escaped this corruption through lost. And so the knowledge of the principles of the kingdom is what we need, first of all. Are you following me? Say after me, knowledge. Knowledge. Say one more time, knowledge. 
That's what we need. That's why you hear people like Pastor Chris say, All you ever need is wrapped up in the word. He says, Go for the word. Go for it. It's the truth. Go for the word. We go for many things, all kinds of things. What we need is to stay with the word. To stay with the word. When the illumination of the word arises in your spirit, it sets you up. It brings you into sonship. The activity of the word of God upon your spirit and upon your mind and upon your body is what brings you into sonship. Knowledge. The second is understanding. The Bible says with all you're getting, get understanding. I shared it um, in a, God bless you sir. I shared it in a Sunday meeting but then I'll share it again. I want to tell you the difference between knowledge and understanding. And I want to use a very practical example. It's believed that we guys don't know how to cook very well. Praise the Lord. Now, it's not like we don't know how to cook. We know we don't understand how to cook. You, you get it now? Because the same ingredients the ladies are using, that's what we are using. Why are the results different? They know when to put what. The, are you following me now? The guys, for instance, jollof rice. If I tell you, give me a quick tip on making jollof rice, that's very easy. Hot water, rice comes in, add oil, add uh, uh, crayfish, add whatever you have left, close it, trust God to do the rest. Yeah. Now, and it has produced some results in our lives because we have been able to eat the food. Yeah. Are you following me now? But when, when a lady is cooking, because by experience she has not only been taught what to do but how to do it she knows that okay after five minutes you add this you are finished adding your own since she has not added her own there are certain things that they add only five minutes when the food is about to be done and then the same ingredients two of you went to the market and then you leave your food and eat her own that's the difference between knowledge and understanding are you following me now knowledge is just acquiring the information knowing that these are the things to be done but understanding gives you the steps it tells you that when you get to this point knowledge says tithe and be blessed understanding says this is the attitude this is how you tithe are you following me now knowledge says give understanding says this is how you give knowledge says the just shall live by faith understanding says this is the dynamics of faith you hear the word, you believe, you step out. Are you following me now? So what we need is not just knowledge. Many believers have knowledge. Rema, 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 Rema that has not translated into anything. We have a lot of Rema. But what we lack is understanding. So in Proverbs he said, with all you're getting, don't just know that this is what needs to be done. You must understand how it should be done. That's why some people walk through some situations as if Satan does not exist. And yet others are still in that situation. Are you getting blessed? Understanding. The understanding of the word. There are several people that have taught about faith. There are several people that have taught so many things about faith. But there are few people that understand how faith works. And it's those who understand and apply it that get the results. It's one thing to say, I live by faith. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, I live by faith. That's just step one. But because we do not understand the operation of faith. What the Bible calls the spirit of faith. So the making of a son is that there is a translation. The word of God begins to walk in you. Children begin to live and manifest the character of Egypt, although they are out of Egypt. You still begin to see bitterness, envy, and all of these things. And the Holy Ghost begins to walk in you. Remember our prayer last week? We prayed about the heart condition. God begins to attack your heart thoroughly until He brings out everything that does not line up with His principles. Then you find out that your heart is pure towards God. 
and then you begin to experience certain riches of the kingdom the making of sons so I'd like for you to know that you don't just receive sonship as an impartation if it were so nobody would still be pressing towards the deep things of the spirit again because as long as we give our lives to Christ we become sons but here any friends it takes a while and the pathway for sonship is that you realize that although you are a child of God you are technon the word of God the understanding of his principles the knowledge the understanding and then the obedience the Bible says they had the word like we did but the word did not profit them not being mixed with faith obedience you must be diligent and obedient you must be diligent and obedient hear me friends your obedience until you have been hammering on this issue of obedience if your obedience is not complete you will never step into the reality of sonship sons are those who have learned how to obey Jesus said my meat is to do and finish the will of him that has sent me even at Gethsemane he said father if it be thy will take this cup of me but he said nevertheless not my will sons have come to a point where they are resolutely obedient even unto death even unto death an heir as long as he's a child friends koinonia is an avenue for us to step up into the reality of sonship enough of this oppression by demons we come shout in tongues sing and dance and then we go back and we are badly oppressed by satan oppressed by sickness oppressed by failure that's the reason why our light unbelievers cannot understand what we are shouting about because the same things that keep them down are the same things that keep us down the same limitation they have is the same limitation we have and so they truly cannot see any difference but when we step into sonship, they begin to see something different about our lives. That when they break down, there is supernatural strength for you to move forward. That when they are communicating with the wisdom of men, you come with the wisdom of God. There's something about your life that attracts them. I told God, I said, Lord, I'm tired of reading about sonship. I want to walk in the reality of it where everything about my life is a message that reflects Christ. And so the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, it says the earnest expectation of creation are waiting for not everybody. You know, we always jump around and say my generation is waiting. You better find out whether your generation is waiting for you or you are the one who is waiting for a savior. The Bible says the earnest expectation of creation is waiting for what? The manifestation of these sets of people. These people who are not only born again, but are full of the word. Men who know the word, men who understand the word, and men who have committed their lives to obey the principles of the word. Men who understand the place of intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Men who understand the laws of the anointing. They understand how to bring the atmosphere of heaven into the lives of people. At that point, you become a blessing. Listen, you cannot help anybody if you are like them. You can't help the poor by being one. You can't help the sick by being one. You can't help the oppressed by being one. It is only when you are out of a system that you can help those in that system. You can't help a depressed person when you are depressed. You can you have to come out. That's why the Bible says, Come out from the among them and be ye separate. Hallelujah. And the Lord desires for us to step into sonship. The Bible says that there is a bondage of corruption upon our generation. And it says, Only the sons, only these sets of people, they may not be many great man of God calls them the remnant there may not be many how be it they are the ones who have refused to bow to the gods of the land they are the ones who have refused to bow to the systems 
They are the ones who have refused to bow to the golden image. And they have said, Lord, I will stay. I will stay in the secret place. I will allow myself to be built. Sons, even when men are calling you great man of God, you thank them with one hand and with the other hand you open the door to your secret place and rush back and say, Lord, I know I'm great, but maybe not great enough yet. Huh. And you stay in the secret place and there is an incubation of the Spirit. And sometimes people look at you and wonder, they say, what are you still looking for? What do you want to become? You want to be disappearing from one place to another? If it's a requirement to shake your generation, then it's relevant to stay until you have it. Listen, when you stay and you are prepared, I tell you the truth, when you step out, you will not be ashamed. I told God something. I said, Lord, never let me step out of a boundary you have not opened for me. Keep me, draw my ears, do anything you do to keep me there. But when the door is open, never let me stay. Push me till I go out. The Lord is making us here, friends. There is a making of sons. This word. If you are a believer, this must become your active partner. The Bible is not, I'm not just talking of uh, inspiring women or um, what's the name? Every day with Jesus or Rhapsody of Realities or whatever it is. There is a place for those devotionals. But I tell you the truth, you need more than it. Satan is doing more than devotional. You must prepare because kingdoms, there will be a clash of kingdoms. And hear me friends, Satan is not folding his arms. Look at the people in the world. They are becoming more spiritual by the day. They used to hide it before. But now it's not hidden again. Businessmen are not hiding the issue of being spiritual again. And God is sending you to the business world. And all you think is read books about finance. You better take this and let it be your friend. Instead of buying Timbaland, buy a concordance. It will teach you the principle to own one of the company if you want to. Listen, friends. The difference between successful people and failures is that successful people delay their gratification now and get the things that are... Buy the truth! It didn't say rent it. Buy it! A lot of us like our wolf. Buy the truth. Buy tapes. Buy books. Sit with the world. For those of us who are students, you finish your exams. Sit with the world. Sit with the word. This book of the law shall not depart from out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate during day and night, that thou mayest be careful to observe all that is written therein. He said, Then, not before, not during, then shalt thou make thy ways prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. Stay with the word. Write a list of the areas where things are not working. Accept responsibility and say, Lord, my faith is not working. I'm tired of lying. Faith, part of your study. What again? You can't pray for people to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Say, I'm tired. I need to know the principles. Write it and stay. The trouble with many believers is that our spiritual growth is not constructive. We are not growing constructively. So when you say you have grown, we ask, okay, try to honestly tell us. What are the parameters to prove that you have grown? You say, now I, I, was, I was an usher, now I'm the chief usher. No. It's not necessarily true. It's not necessarily true. There are certain realities in the spirit. It's not pride. There are some things that you shouldn't be struggling with at certain levels. It's not pride. That's the proof of growth. Imagine at this level of your life, you are still trying to walk. What do we call you? You need a miracle. Imagine at this level of your life, you are still trying to wear your clothes. You don't know whether to put the, your shoe right or left. Are you following me? How many of you have worn your shoe and said, ah, ah, I was able to really wear it well today? No. That's how it is in the spirit. There are some things that should embarrass you back to the secret place. 
You should get tired of some things and say, Lord, I can keep running from pillar to post. At least if I'm not where I should be, I shouldn't be where I was. And you lock yourself and say, I am let there be that transition. There is a kind of dissatisfaction. It's a holy one that draws the man to such. And you get back and sit with the word. And someone says, the man of God, are you around? You tell him, no, I'm not around. There are many of us that cannot switch our phone. That's our spiritual limitation. You look, it looks as if your phone, it will pin you. Anything God gives you that you cannot lay aside for where you are going, is an idol. Before you got the phone, you were alive. Lock that phone and seek the word of God. Get a rechargeable lantern. Or get whatever you get. And play a tape. And sit down. Sometimes you play that tape. While it's, pray, while it's playing, you are praying in the spirit. And soaking in that glory. Come on, it won't be too long. It won't be too long. Something about your life must leak. There's no secret about it. There is no secret about it. Your faith is not working. Stay with the word of God. Listen to the messages that you can get on faith. Sit down. See, I'm teaching you how to be sons. Because I must apologize to you. But I think we were talking some time ago with the pastors at home. And we, we men of God have not really done justice to God's people. Because we have not paid the price to teach them the principles. What's the use if I come and stand here and I say, Stosi, stand up. This guy, stand up. And I just say, all right, everybody watch this. I just wave my hand and somebody falls. How does that equip the people? Except you, like I did last week, trying to use it to demonstrate something. Are you following me? See, sons are not carried away by results. When sons watch someone walking, every time I watch men of God, I'm really not looking at the results. I'm finding out my spirit is scanning through what they are doing. What Lord did this guy touch in the spirit? Hallelujah. What law is he touching in the spirit? That's how sons think. Some of us say, well, God has not called me into ministry. God has told me what my own call is. I'll just be motivating people, counsel people. And so you feel there's no need. The trouble is, we have been made to think every time you give an unusual attention to the word ministry. No. No, sir. They are life to those who find them. And health to the flesh. My son, pay attention to my words. Incline your ears to my saying. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. He said they are life. This is life and death, my brother. It has nothing to do with ministry. We live in a world where until you are solidified by the word, Satan will eat you up and spit out your bones. chosen to stay with the word I've chosen to I say it without apology at almost every time you come to my house you find us diligently studying students of the word nobody is carried away by ministry no students they are burden of ministry God didn't give me any burden God gave me a call people put yokes on themselves as a result of their negligence to abide by God's principles after me I go for the word it will make me a son when things are not happening see your finances are not working well why are you studying on relationship go and address an issue that is not working hallelujah sit down and Let's, let's tell something. When an area begins to work in your spiritual life, you are motivated to serve God better. There's nothing as frustrating as every area not working in your life. You just ask yourself, oh, what, what am I even doing? If, finance is, uh, if your finance is working and then the gift of the Spirit is not working, at least you are motivated. One over two. So you can press for the other one. But where every area is a wilderness. I'm 
trying to put something in your spirit this night. That when you leave this place, when somebody is distracting you from studying the word, you know that is your enemy. Hallelujah. Some of you stay and when you want to study the word, someone says, ah, we need to go and visit this so and so person. And like, ah, it's been a while. Though. It's been a while. Sit with the word. Sit with the word. That's the singular pathway to sonship. Therefore, say after me, the pathway to sonship is to stay with the word. To know the word. To understand the word. And to obey the word. I have a guarantee for you. If you truly abide by these things I'm teaching you tonight, it will not be too long. I tell you the truth. Your profiting will appear unto all in a way that will shock you. These are practical principles. Be a student of the word, I beg you. Day and night, sit with the word. Invest in books. Invest in materials. Some of the teachings that we have here, I think yesterday or so, in chapel, we were listening to the message last week. And I sat by there. I didn't say, I am the one that preached it. I already know. We sat quietly. And we are soaking into these things. That's why we give, we give all the teachings from when Koinonia started. And, and the ones between school. is free. Very free. All you need to do is just get it. And sit with the word. Get all that relevant teachings. Stay with the word. If you are studying on faith, concentrate on faith and get it. Be sure that you have gotten it. Then you can move to something else. Let your growth be constructive. Am I blessing you, friends? There are many of us that things are not moving. You are just acting like things are working. You know things are not working. Get tired. Stay in the presence. You have prayed for over 200 people. Nobody has even recovered. Not even to get healed. Not even recovered. Don't just say, well, some people is like that. God gives. No. Begin to find out what is the spiritual principle that releases the anointing. And then commit yourself to it. This is what I know to be the pathway of sonship. There are many things that we teach and they are equally important the place of your seed the place of service in the body and other things they are very important but the foundation the foundational pathway to sonship is to stay with the word of God know the word understand it understand it to, to understand you need the illumination of the spirit and then you also need to follow them who through faith and patience have obtained the promise. Hallelujah. How many of us truly want to step in the reality of sonship? How many of us are trusting God to step up in certain areas of our lives? There are some of us, our families, things are not working. Our families are in a mess. Who told you you cannot change it? You can. If you could not change it, God will not bring you here. He has brought you to let you know that you can do something about it. We are going to pray. So we'll round up. And our prayer tonight is very simple. Lord, I want to begin to see the reality of sonship work in my life. I want to see the reality of sonship. The reality. Please, you see, don't take for granted these things we are sharing. They may look basic, but they are powerful. It's the foundation, the word of God. The word of God. Go ahead and cry. Say, Lord, my life must make progress. The Holy Ghost is in my life to bring beauty and glory. Go ahead and pray. Please make sure you are praying. Tonight God has committed something in our hands that will set us above. The pathway to sonship is the path that stays with the word of God. Stays with the word of God. Understands God's principles. It's a sacrifice. 
bring your mind and your body under the influence of the word. But when you do, happy as thou. Because heaven becomes a reality in your life. I don't care what the situation is in your life. This is the solution tonight. No matter how impossible it looks. I have not seen a man that has given true diligence to the word. The word of God will make you a son. The word of God will make you a son. The word of God will translate you from being a child to a son. Stay with the word. Brothers and sisters, stay with the word. It is life. 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 The principles of the world are the principles by which heaven are designed to function by. Go ahead and pray and say, Lord, grace. Grace. I receive grace to be an ardent student of the world. Don't let the devil deceive you. Make sure you are praying. Grace to be an ardent student of the world. Go for knowledge. Go for knowledge. Go for knowledge. It will place you above. Go for knowledge. Don't go for results. Go for knowledge. The knowledge, the understanding, and obedience will give you every result. Go for knowledge, not just results. Go for knowledge. Invest in the world. Invest in the world. Invest in books. Invest in tapes. Don't just buy them. Use them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The second prayer point very quickly. Is we are going to say, Lord, open me up to the understanding of your principles. There are many of us that we have knowledge. But what we lack is understanding. We know what to do, but we don't know how to do it. Lift up the voice and pray. And say, Lord, understanding. Understanding of your principles. Over my finances. Over my health. Over my life. Over my ministry. Over my business. Over my family. Make sure you are praying. Let's raise our voice tonight and pray understanding teach me how it is done not just what to do tell him Lord teach me what buttons I need to press in the spirit what principles I need to keep teach me how it is done Lord we receive understanding let there be a baptism of understanding a baptism of understanding Understanding, 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 understanding. Hey, they are life to those who find them. It's a secret that will not fail. I assure you, it's a secret that will not fail. When you find it, you have found gold. When you found find it. You have found a treasure. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The last prayer point. The last prayer point. We are going to pray for grace to be obedient. It's one thing to know. It's one thing to understand. There are many of us that know about tithing, for instance. There are many of us that understand. But there are very few of us that have been consistent. The degree to which you have been consistent is the degree to which your finances have been. So, hear me. There are some issues you need to realize that there are some things in the spirit that even after you have prayed about them, until you obey the principles, you will never see the results. So, every time you are praying, God will be directing you in your prayer. 
to the principles. While you are praying in tongues, God will show you visions of yourself obeying that word. Until you obey it, you will not see a performance. Go ahead and pray. Now, you are going to receive grace. Hear me. You know the area of your life that you need radical change. You need some things to change. You must get dissatisfied. If not, nothing will change about your life. Hallelujah. And so we are going to be praying. Mention the areas of your life. And say, Lord, grace to obey your word. My body will not be a limitation. Some of you will need to fast. Fasting will not kill you, friends. Fasting has not killed anybody who did it diligently and in accordance to God's principles. Some of you may need to go for a retreat away from people for a while. Some of you may need to switch off your phones for a while. You will not die. Grace to obey in the area of my finances. Grace to obey your principles concerning my health. Grace to obey your principles concerning ministry. Grace to obey. Come on, pray, pray, pray. We are praying. We'll soon round up. I abide by your principles. Whether my mind likes it or not, I abide by your principles. Whether the body is ready to cooperate or not, by the grace and the power of the Holy Ghost, I bring my mind under subjection to your word. I bring my body under subjection. Body, you must cooperate with the word. Mind, you must cooperate with the word. Until my reality becomes heaven. Grace to obey. Grace to do consistent obedience. Total obedience. Total obedience. Not part obedience. Not partial obedience. Grace to obey the law of tithing. Grace to obey the law of confessing the word. Speaking right. Prayer. Staying with God's word. Abstinence from every appearance of evil. Grace to obey. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Paul speaking to his son Timothy said, Meditate on these things. He said, Give yourself wholly to them. He said, Your profiting shall appear. I give you a guarantee, friends. For as many of you who will take these things serious, I assure you that you will shock yourself. It's not a prophecy, it's the truth. It will happen. Hallelujah. Father, tonight we thank you. In this place, make us sons. Bring us into the position of sonship. Where your word becomes a reality in our lives. Bring us to that point. Where we become the living word. Active to our environment. A revelation that God is alive. A revelation that his kingdom is superior. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you very much for listening to this powerful sermon. We hope you were blessed. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel to listen to Apostle Joshua Selman's messages, Apostle Arome Osai's messages, Archbishop Benson Dahosa and Apostle Shubi Oluwatsubilola sermon. Thank you very much. Enjoy. <laughs>